there. Innately, we all desire to merge with others, and we also all desire a sense of self. We have these seemingly contradictory desires because we are ultimately multidimensional beings. This means at one level of us, we are aware that we are one with everything that is. At another level of us, we are expressions of that oneness that perceives ourselves to be singular expressions of that consciousness with free will. This desire between contradictory or seemingly contradictory states, it causes an endless push and pull within us relative to other people because we believe that we have to choose between them. However, if we are traumatized at some point in our life by relationships, what we tend to do is to polarize to one direction or to the other. For example, if we are traumatized when we are younger by what we call enmeshment, that is, somebody is overly involved or controlling of ourselves, we tend to polarize towards being completely independent. We develop a fear of relationships. We push them away. On the other hand, if we're traumatized at some point in our lives by disconnection and loneliness, we tend to polarize towards merging to the point where we're terrified of autonomy and our boundaries are too weak. This week I received a letter in the mail that struck me. It was from a girl who wanted to know why it is that developing a sense of self feels so bad. Why developing boundaries makes her feel sorrow. Why it was that all of these self-help techniques that teach you that you can be the universe unto yourself feel like the opposite of what she really wants. The spiritual and the self-help fields are completely about helping the self, developing the self. They tend to focus entirely on the idea of autonomy. Think about it. How many times in the spiritual community or the self-help community have you heard things like this? Fill up your own cup. Everything you could ever want or need is inside you. The only approval you need is your own. No one else can make you happy, only you can do that. Essentially self-centered ideologies that exalt the idea of spiritual, emotional, mental, and physical independence. For some people, these ideologies are liberating. It feels amazing to them. For other people, it feels extremely painful. Why is this? I'm going to explain. Having a sense of self versus other is a part of participating in this physical dimension. The individual perspective and experience is what is currently serving the expansion of this universe, and so we perceive a difference between ourselves and the rest of the world. This individual perspective is a kind of boundary that defines us from everything else. This is why, in a world where we operate from an individual perspective, it is important to develop healthy boundaries. But what are boundaries, really? Boundaries are not walls between you and the world. In fact, boundaries are nothing more than a defined sense of self. If I say I like chocolate ice cream and you say you like vanilla ice cream, those preferences are in fact boundaries we both have. Those boundaries do not conflict with each other. A person may say, I want to keep my life private. And another might say, I want to be open with my life, and because you're part of my life, that means that I need to tell the world what you said. Those boundaries are in conflict, and it's these conflicting boundaries that cause the conflicts in our relationships. A sense of self, therefore boundary, includes a sense of how someone relates to the self to the rest of the world. They are rules of conduct built out of a mix of beliefs, opinions, attitudes, past experiences, and social learning. Personal boundaries operate in two directions, affecting both the incoming and outgoing interactions between people. Personal boundaries help to define an individual by outlining likes and dislikes, what is right for them personally and wrong for them personally, and defining these things helps us to know how we will and won't allow ourselves to be treated by others. How do healthy boundaries develop? They develop when parents allow healthy boundaries to exist between themselves and their children that there's the problem. When children are in the process of being socialized by their parents, often parents of today's age 
don't even take boundaries into consideration. We do not see children as people, so we do not address them as if they have valid likes and dislikes, valid wants and needs. We don't address them as if it's appropriate for them to be different than us. Long story short, parents are so often identified with their children that they violate a child's boundaries again and again by trying to make the child a mini version of themselves, a reflection of their desires, likes, and dislikes. When a child in this kind of environment tries to express a boundary, the parent feels invalidated. And if it is an unconscious parent, the parent then reacts defensively to this invalidation. They react by violating the boundary in an incoming intrusive way or an outgoing distancing way. people think of boundary violation, we only think of incoming boundary violation. Things like controlling someone else or calling them names or straight up slapping them. But there's another kind of boundary violation which is in fact more damaging. It's distancing boundary violation. It's an outgoing boundary violation. It is to say that if you act in a certain way, I'm going to violate our connection by withdrawing. The child who experiences incoming boundary violations as a child is the one who develops an adult self that tries to resist relationships. They gravitate in the direction of unhealthy independence because they have enmeshment trauma. This child has been educated that it is not okay to have a sense of self or to have boundaries. The subconscious message growing up was, you can't have you and stay emotionally or even physically safe around me at the same time. On the other hand, the child that experiences distancing boundary violations is the one that develops an extreme anxiety about being disconnected. They become the clingy child that just will not let go, that is hanging on for dear life to somebody, anybody they can find, especially the primary attachment figure, because they are so desperately afraid of the starvation, of the disconnection. They're desperately afraid of the isolation, which is in fact the very trauma that they endured. This child has been educated that it is not okay to have a sense of self or to have boundaries. To have a sense of self or autonomy was to be isolated. Isolation is a form of torture. Let's take a look at how this might play out in a real world scenario. Let's say you've got a mother and her three-year-old daughter, and the two of them have to go to church. But the little daughter decides, what I want to do is to wear my cowboy boots, my jeans, and my lucky Star Wars t-shirt. But the mom, what she wants, according to her own boundary, is for people in her life to see her as a competent mother. Obviously, if her daughter goes to church dressed like that, no one's going to think that way. So that particular desire, want, and need of the daughter really doesn't fit in with the mother's wants, needs, and desires. The daughter asserts this boundary, but her mother would rather that she wear a dress. So, after this conflict ensues, instead of explaining the situation to her daughter and coming to a meeting of minds or lovingly enforcing a limitation where neither party has their boundaries violated, this mother chooses to shake her head in disgust and walk away. The message this mother has sent her child is, you can't have you and have me at the same time. If you are a person who has found your way to spirituality in order to try to feel better in your life, but these more self-centered ideologies such as fill up your own cup, everything you need is inside you, the only person who can make you happy is you, makes you feel like total crap, then you are the kind of person who has suffered ongoing, outgoing violations to your boundaries. These self-centered ideologies that are liberating to the person who feels trapped by connection with others are instead re-triggering the trauma of isolation. They are reinforcing the idea that you're all alone always will be and that needing connection is not okay. If we are this kind of person, we begin to view our own boundaries like bargaining chips. We're willing to let them go as long as it gets us connection. So we're the kind of person who gives up our personal preferences in favor of other people's preferences because at least we get to be with them. One form that this takes particularly strongly in women is sexual boundaries. We tend to just abandon our sexual boundaries completely because we can transactionally get away with giving you sex so we can guarantee connection. 
So today I have some news for you. But it's not just news for you. It's also news for your counterpart. Those people who love those self-centered ideologies, who feel liberated by the idea that all you need is you because they feel trapped in relationships. So this news I'm about to give to you is news for the both of you. And here it is. The door to your heart will be unlocked the minute you get that you have adopted a very unconscious and extremely painful limiting belief that you cannot have yourself and have other people at the same time. And guess what? It isn't true. There doesn't have to be a conflict between your sense of self and connecting with other people. Right now, you don't have much proof to back this up, but we have to start somewhere. So what if you can have a sense of self and also merge with others? What if you could have boundaries and have connection? What if you can have yourself and have other people at the same time? What if these seemingly contradictory desires are in fact complementary? To deepen your understanding relative to this topic, I want you to watch two videos I created on YouTube. The first is how to develop healthy boundaries. And the second is and consciousness, the modern day replacement for the middle way. We can think of a boundary as an imaginary line that uniquely defines your personal happiness, your personal integrity, your personal desires, your personal needs, and therefore, most importantly, your personal truth relative to the rest of the universe. But none of that means you are all alone. You can have that and have intimate connection and companionship at the exact same time. Sometimes we are with people who are truly incompatible to us. That means that our personal boundaries and their personal boundaries are going to be in conflict when we're in the time-space reality of the physical dimension together. And when this is the case, quite often we can no longer share space physically. But I don't want you to think that this means you're all alone. In fact, if you adhere to your own personal values, your own personal truths, your desires, your wants, your needs, what will happen is you will have stopped abandoning yourself. And as a result of that, you will now be a vibrational match to people who will never abandon you. You will be a match to people who are truly, truly compatible to you. And those people will leave you with a sense of being completely in company with people who will connect to you, who will not abandon you, who will not leave, and who will in fact make you feel completely connected. The opposite of loneliness and isolation. So today I'm going to leave you with this particular truth. You can have yourself and have other people at the very same time. In fact, the best relationships are the result of establishing this truth within yourself and within your relationships. You don't have to choose between them. Have a good week.